Hey there, this is Jesse Johnson again. I'll just be reading The Princess Bride tonight. Just picking up during chapter one from where I left off. He took 17 minutes. I just hung on, listening. Every so often, I'd hear a footstep or a crash of books or a grunt. Finally, well, I got the Florinese like I thought. So close. But not the English, I said. And suddenly he's yelling at me. What are you, crazy? I break my back and he says I haven't got it. Yes, I've got it. I got it right here. And believe me, it's going to cost a pretty penny. Great, really, no kidding. Now listen, here's what you do. Get yourself a cab and tell him to take the books straight up to park and Mr. California Bagunshiga. You listen now. It's coming up a blizzard, and I'm going no place, and neither are these books without money. Six fifty on the barrel each. You want the English, you've got to take the Florinese, and I close at six o'clock. These books don't leave my premises without thirteen dollars changing hands. Don't move, I said, hanging up. And who do you call when it's after hours and Christmas on the horizon? Only your lawyer. Charlie, I said when I got him. Please do me this. Go to 4th Avenue, Abramowitz, and give him $13 for two books. Taxi up to my house and tell the doorman to take them to my apartment. And yes, I know it's snowing. What do you say? It's such a bizarre request. I have to agree to do it. I call Abramowitz yet again. My lawyer is hot on the trail. No checks, Abramowitz said. You're all hard. I hung up and started figuring. More or less 120 minutes long distance at... A dollar thirty-five per first three minutes, plus thirteen for the books, plus probably ten for Charlie's taxi, plus probably sixty for his time came to two hundred and fifty, maybe. All for my Jason to have the Morgenstern. I leaned back and closed my eyes. Two hundred fifty, not to mention two solid hours of tormesh and anguish, and let's not forget Sandy Sterling. Steel. They called me at half past seven. I was in my suite. He loves the bike, Helen said. He's practically out of control. Fabo, I said. Oh, and your books came. Oh, what books, I said. Chevalier and never more casual. The Princess Bride, in various languages. One of them, fortunately, English. Well, that's nice, I said, still loose. I practically forgot I asked to have them sent. How'd they get here? I asked my editor's secretary and had her scrounge up a couple of copies. Maybe they had them at Harcourt, who knows? They did have copies at Harcourt. Can you buy that? I get to Y in the next pages, probably. Give me the kid. Hi, he said a second later. Listen, Jason, I told him. We thought about giving you a bike for your birthday, but we decided against it. <laughs> Boy, are you wrong. I got one already. Jason has inherited his mother's total lack of humor. I don't know. Maybe he's funny and I'm not. We just don't laugh at each other much together, is all I can say for sure. My son Jason is this incredible looking kid. Paint him yellow, he'd mop up for the school sumo team. A blimp, all the time stuffing his face. I watch my weight and old heaven is only visible full front, plus on top of which she is this leading child shrink in Manhattan and our kid can roll faster than he can walk. He's expressing himself through food, Helen always says. His anxieties. When he feels ready to cope, he'll slim down. Hey, Jason? Mom tells me this book arrived today. The princess thing. I'd sure like it if maybe you'd give it a read while I'm gone. I loved it when I was a kid, and I'm kind of interested in your reaction. Do I have to love it too? He was his mother's son, all right. <laughs> Jason, no. Just the truth, exactly what you think. I miss you, big shot. And I'll talk to you on your birthday. Boy, are you wrong. It is my birthday. We bantered a bit more, long past when there was much to say. Then I did the same by my, with my spouse, hung up, promising a return by the end of one week. It took two. Conferences dragged, producers got inspirations that had to carefully get shot down, directors needed their egos soothed. Anyway, I was longer than anticipated in sunny California. Finally, though, I was allowed to return to the care and safety of the family, so I quick buzzed to L.A. airport before anybody's mind changed. I got there early, which I always do when I come back, because I had to load up my pockets with doodads and such for Jason. Every time I get home from a trip, he runs, 
waddles to me, hollering, let me see, let me see the pockets! And then he goes through all my pockets, taking out his graft, and once the loot is totaled, he gives me a nice hug. Isn't it awful what we'll do in this world to feel wanted? Let me see the pockets! Jason shouted, moving to me across the foyer. It was supper time Thursday, and while he went through his ritual, Helen emerged from the library and kissed my cheek, going, what a dashing-looking fellow I have. Which is also ritual, and laden with gift. Jaden kind of hugged me and belted off, waddled off, to his room. Angelica's just getting dinner on, Helen said. You couldn't have timed it better. Angelica? Helen put her finger to her lips and whispered, It's her third day on, but I think she may be a treasure. I whispered back, What was wrong with the treasure we had when I left? She'd only been a week with us then. She proved a disappointment, Helen said. That was all. Helen is this brilliant lady, junior Phi Bet in college, every academic honor conceivable, really an intellect of startling breadth and accomplishment, only she can't keep a maid. First, I guess she feels guilty having anybody, since most of the anybody's available nowadays are black or Spanish, and Helen is ultra super liberal. Second, she's so efficient she scares them. She could do everything better than they can, and she knows it, and she knows they know it. The third, once she's got them panicked, she tries to explain, being an analyst, why they shouldn't be frightened, and after a good solid half-hour ego search with Helen, they're really frightened. Anyway, we've had an average of four treasures a year for the last few years. We've been running in bad luck, but it'll change, I said, just as reassuring as I knew how. I used to heckle her about the help problem, but I learned that that was not necessarily wise. Dinner was ready a little later, and with an arm around my wife and an arm around my son, I advanced toward the dining room. I felt at that moment safe, secure, all the nice things. Supper was on the table. Creamed spinach, mashed potatoes, gravy and pot roast. Terrific. Except I don't like the pot roast, since I'm a rare meat man, and creamed spinach I have a lech for, so all in all, a more than edible spread was set across the tablecloth. We sat. Helen served the meat, the rest we passed. My pot roast slice was not terribly moist, but the gravy could compensate. Helen rang. Angelica appeared. Maybe 20 or 18. Swarthy, slow-moving. Angelica, Helen began. This is Mr. Goldman. I smiled and said hi and waved a fork. She nodded back. Angelica, this is not meant to be construed as criticism, since what happened is all my fault, but in the future we must try very hard to remember that Mr. Goldman likes his roast beef rare. This is roast beef, I said. Helen shot me a look. Now, Angelica, there is no problem, and I should have told you more than once about Mr. Goldman's preferences, but next time we'd have boned rib roast. Let's all do our best to make the middle pink, shall we? Angelica backed into the kitchen. Another treasure down the tubes. Remember now, we all three started this meal happy. Two of us are left in that state, Helen clearly being distraught. Jason was piling the mashed potatoes on his plate with a practiced and steady motion. I smiled at my kid. Hey, I tried. Let's go a little easy, huh, fella? He splatted another fat spoonful onto his plate. Jason, they're, they're just loaded. I said then. I'm really hungry, Dad, he said, not looking at me. Fill up on the meat, then, why don't you? I said. Eat all the meat you want, I won't say a word. I'm not eating nothing, Jason said, and he shoved his plate away and folded his arms and stared off into space. If I were a furniture salesperson, Helen said to me, or perhaps a teller in a bank, I could understand... But how can you have spent all these years married to a psychiatrist and still talk like that? You're under the dark ages, Willie. Helen, the boy is overweight. All I suggested was he might leave a few potatoes for the rest of the world and stuff on this lovely prime rot roast your treasure is whipped up for my triumphant return. Willie, I don't want to shock you, but Jason happens to have not only a very fine mind, but also exceptionally keen eyesight. When he looks at himself in the mirror, I assure you he knows he is not slender. That is because he does not choose, at this stage, to be slender. He's not that far from dating, Helen. What then? 
Jason is ten, darling, and not interested at this stage in girls. At this stage, he is interested in rockery, rocketry. What difference does a slight case of overweight make to a rocket lover? When he chooses to be slender, I assure you he has both the intelligence and the willpower to become slender. Until that time, please, in my presence, do not frustrate the child. Sandy Sterling in her bikini was dancing behind my eyes. I'm not eating and that's it, Jason said then. Sweet child, Helen said to the kid in that tone she reserves on this earth only for such moments. Be logical. If you do not eat your potatoes, you will be upset and I will be upset. Your father clearly is already upset. If you do eat your potatoes, I shall be pleased. You shall be pleased. Your tummy will be pleased. We can do nothing about your father. You have it in your power to upset all or one about whom, as I've already said, we can do nothing. Therefore, the conclusion should be clear. But I have faith in your ability to reach it yourself. Do what you will, Jason. He began to stuff it in. You're making a poof out of that child, I said, only not loud enough for any but me and Sandy to hear. And then I took a deep, deep breath, because whenever I come home, there's always trouble. Which is because, Helen says, I bring tension with me. I always need inhuman proof that I've been missed, and that I'm still needed, loved, etc. All I know is, I hate being away, but coming home is the worst. There's never really much chance to go into, well, what's new since I'm gone, chit-chat, seeing that Helen and I talk every night anyway. I bet you're a whiz on that bike, I said then. Maybe we'll go for a ride this weekend. Jason looked up from his potatoes. I really loved the book, Dad. It was great. I was surprised that he said it, because naturally I was just starting to work my way into that subject matter. But then, as Helen's always saying, Jason ain't no dummy. Well, I'm glad, I said, and was I ever. Jason nodded. Maybe it's the best I've ever read in all my life. I nibbled away at my spinach. What was your favorite part? Chapter one, the bread, Jason said. That really surprised me. Not that chapter one stinks or anything, but there's not that much that goes on compared with the incredible stuff later. But I've got grows up mostly, is all. How about the climb up the cliffs of insanity? I said then. That's in chapter five. Oh, great, Jason said. And a description of Prince Hubberdink's Zoo of Death? That's in the second chapter. Even greater, Jason said. What knocked me out about it, I said was that it's this very short little passage on the zoo of death, but yet somehow you just know it's going to figure in later. Did you get that same feeling? Um-hmm. Jason nodded. Great. But I knew he hadn't really read it. He tried to read it, Helen cut in. He did read the first chapter. Chapter two was impossible for him, so when he'd made a sufficient and reasonable attempt, I told him to stop. Different people have different tastes. I told him you'd understand, Willie. Of course I understood. I just felt so deserted, though. I didn't like it, Dad. I wanted to. I smiled at him. How could he not like it? Passion, duels, miracles, giants, true love. You're not eating the spinach, either? Helen said. I got up. Time change. I'm not hungry. She didn't say anything until she heard me open the front door. Where are you going? She called then. If I'd known, I wouldn't have answered. I wandered through December. No top coat. I wasn't aware of being cold, though. All I knew is I was 40 years old, and I didn't mean to be here when I was 40, locked with this genius shrink wife and this balloon son. It must have been nine o'clock when I was sitting in the middle of Central Park, alone, no one near me, no other bench occupied. That was when I heard the rustling in the bushes. It stopped. Then again. Very soft. Nearer. I whirled, screaming, Don't you bug me! And whatever it was, friend, flow, imagination, fled. I could hear the running, and I realized something. Right then, at that moment, I was dangerous. Then it was cold. I went home. Helen was going over some notes in bed. Ordinarily, she would come out with something about me being a bit elderly for acts of juvenile behavior. But there must have been danger clinging to me still. I could see it in her smart eyes. He did try, she said, finally. I never thought he didn't, I answered. Where's the book? The library, I think? 
I turned, started out. Can I get you anything? I said no. Then I went to the library, closed myself in, hunted out the Princess Bride. It was in pretty good shape, I realized as I checked the binding, which is when I saw it was published by my publishing house, Harcourt Brace Jonovich. This was before that. They weren't even Harcourt, Brace and World yet. Just plain old Harcourt, Brace, period. I flicked to the title page, which was funny, since I'd never done that before. It was always my father who'd done the handling. I had to laugh when I saw the real title, because there it said, The Princess Bride, S. Morgenstern's classic tale of true love and high adventure. You had to admire a guy who called his own new book a classic before it was published, and anyone else had a chance to read it. Maybe he figured if he didn't do it, nobody would. Or maybe he was just trying to give the reviewers a helping hand. I don't know. I skimmed the first chapter, and it was pretty much exactly as I remembered. Then I turned to the second chapter, the one about Prince Humperdinck and the little kind of tantalizing description of the Zoo of Death. And that's where I began to realize the problem. Not that the description wasn't there. It was, and again, pretty much as I remembered it. But before you got to it, there were maybe 60 pages of text dealing with Prince Humperdinck's ancestry and how his family got control of Florin and this wedding and that child begetting this one over here who then married somebody else. And I skipped to the third chapter of the courtship. And that was all about the history of Gilder and how that country reached its place in the world. The more I flipped on, the more I knew. Morgenstern wasn't writing any children's book. He was writing a kind of satiric history of his country and the decline of the monarchy in Western civilization. But my father only read me the action stuff, the good parts. He never bothered with the serious side at all. About two in the morning, I called Hiram in Martha's Vineyard. Hiram Hayden's been my editor for a dozen years, ever since Soldier in the Rain. And we've been through a lot together, but never any phone calls at two in the morning. To this day, I know he doesn't understand why I couldn't wait till maybe breakfast. You're sure you're all right, Bill? He kept saying. Hey, Hiram, I began after about six rings. Listen, you guys published the book just after World War I. Do you think it might be a good idea for me to abridge it and we'll republish it now? You're sure you're all right, Bill? Fine, absolutely. And see, I'll just use the good parts. I'd kind of bridge where there were skips in the narrative and leave the good parts alone. What do you think? Bill, it's two in the morning up here. Are you still in California? I acted like I was all shocked and surprised, so he wouldn't think I was a nut. I'm sorry, Hiram. My God, what an idiot. It's only 11 o'clock in Beverly Hills. Do you think you could ask Mr. Jonovich, though? You mean now? Tomorrow or the next day. No big deal. I'll ask him anything, only I'm not quite sure I'm getting an accurate reading on what exactly you want. You sure you're all right, Bill? I'll be in New York tomorrow. Call you then about the specifics, okay? Could you make it a little earlier in the business day, Bill? I laughed and we hung up and I called Zig in California. Everett Zeigler had been my movie agent for maybe eight years. He did Butch Cassidy deal for me and I woke him up too. Hey, Zig, could you get me a prop uh, postponement on the Stepford Wives? There's this other thing that's come up. You're contracted to start now. How long a postponement? I can't say for sure. I've never done an abridgment before. Just tell me what you think they'll do. I think it's a long postponement they'd threaten to sue and you'd end up losing the job. It came out pretty much as he said. They threatened to sue and I almost lost the money and some money and didn't make any friends in the industry, as those of us in showbiz call movies. But the abridgment got done and you hold it in your hands. The good parts version. Why did I go through all that? Helen pressured me greatly to think about an answer. She felt it was important. Not that she knows necessarily, but that I know. Because you acted crackers, Willie boy, she said. You had me truly scared. So why? I never was worth beans at self-scrutiny. Everything I write is impulse. This feels right, that sounds wrong, like that. I can't analyze, not my own actions anyway. I know I don't expect this to change anybody else's life the way it altered mine. But take the title words, true love and high adventure. I believed in that once. I thought my life was going to follow that path, 
prayed that it would. Obviously, it didn't, but I don't think there's high adventures left anymore. Nobody takes out a sword nowadays and cries, Hello, my name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. And true love, you can forget about too. I don't know if I love anything truly anymore beyond the porterhouse at Peter Luger's and the cheese enchilada at El Parador's. Sorry about that, Helen. Anyway, here's the good parts version. S. Morgenstern wrote it, and my father read it to me, and now I give it to you. What you do with it will be of more than passing interest to us all. New York City, December, 1972. Okay, so that fully completes the introduction to the story. Next time I'm looking forward to getting the actual story started, but I'd like not to um I'd like not to leave off a chapter halfway through again this time, so you'll excuse me for cutting it off short. Thank you very much, and I'll see you next time.